And, um, you know, it's, it's a dependency management tool, just like everything else out there. Uh, so, but in this case, like we're using it for managing our Drupal modules and PHP libraries, and it can also manage third-party JavaScript libraries and other stuff if you wanted to. So there are other tools that are generally recommended for that stuff. Like NPM is generally the go-to for non-PHP stuff in this case. And, you know, a lot of, uh, I hear this one often that Composer sucks. And I'm just going to say they all do. They really, really, all of them do. Like, I, I really don't like NPM at all. I'm not a big fan of Yarn either. But, like, this, this, this whole space is kind of a shit show. And the, the big reason for that is, uh, you know, people will say it's slow. It's like they all are. And the, the big part of that is that dependency management. Because when you have a, li a library or a module or whatever it is, like, it's depending on other things. And those things might be depending on other things and other things and so on and so forth, right? So you have a giant graph of all these dependencies. And when you start looking at it, um, in computer science, it's what they call an NP-complete problem. And that basically means that this problem cannot be solved in what they call polynomial time. So like it's not a linear um, 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 line that goes and says, okay, if you add 100 modules, it's going to be this, just 100, like, um, it's going to be this much slower. No, it becomes exponentially slower at each of these things. And if someone is actually able to solve this problem, then they can solve any other problems that also fall in this area. And then they can qualify for a prize that's worth a million bucks. Like that's a real, an actual math problem. But of course, if you take in the private space, you could learn more, but that's besides the point. Um, but at the end of the day, um, Composer is actually one of the better ones out there for, for people that don't believe it. It, it truly is. Like it, it um, cause it, it kind of does a compromise of some of the things that are in Ruby with, with its, with Bundler, which is really slow and with, with NPM, which is faster, but because of the way it lays out the dependencies, it just takes up a shit ton of space. So Composer tries to do a kind of middle line thing with this stuff and it does a decent enough job at the very least. And, and so then we get into a different Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Rick. I do want to ask you one real quick question about that, about the comment about Composer being slow. Sure. And, and I, forgive me if this is a dumb question, but what do, they, what do they mean by slow? I mean, I got a pretty enterprise site. And sure, when I first run Composer require whatever, some mod mm -hmm. work, or even Composer install, right? Let's say I just, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, it, it takes 15, 20 seconds, I guess, to go through and look at, you know, through that. 20 million line lock file or whatever but come on i mean it doesn't take that long i mean look at the job that it's doing what well, do, what do they mean by slow that once it starts well, so going the thing it, is that let's fast. say you're well let's say you're starting on a project right your yeah. de your dependencies are changing with right. all of that stuff it's not like it's necessarily you're pinned down to you know x version of environment indicator indicator or font your face or something like that you might be changing all of that stuff or let's right. say you're working or you have included a module that, you know, is basically changing daily. Like you have a dev release of something, it's super hot, like people are just on it and just plugging away at it, doing stuff. And yeah. let's say you don't have a lock file. Well, suddenly that project that, you know, okay, sure, with a lock file, it takes 15 to 20 seconds. But without the lock file, I mean, I've spent time on, I, I remember I wanted to try and demo Lightning or not lightning, um, thunder for the group at some point. And it took like 30 to 40 minutes just to try and get all of the dependencies installed on my machine. And then it ran out of memory. And it's just like, Oh, I get it. What the hell? It's like, and, and then I, and then I kind of have to say, I can't present guys because my composer is just, just being, a, being a jerk to me. So, right. you know, it's like, right. there are legit issues with this stuff, but at I, the same time, it. it's a hard, problem it's a thankless problem and you know as much as i might want to say f you to the people that work on composer i know it's a thankless job and i can't and i won't say something like that yeah but that's a, I, I, that's why i say you know thank you for providing yeah. what a, thank you for dealing with their shit show that's 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 what i say yeah for that. well that's a um, scenario i hadn't really given any thought but that makes sense i mean if you had a huge build and you're installing it for the first time and it's got a 
install all of that all at once. And yeah, that's, that's a massive job. Right. Or let's say, you know, again, like some places they don't include a composer lock file. Like, um, uh, yeah, for some projects, like people might not include composer.lock or similarly with NPM, they might not include the package lock or, or whatever. Like it's, it, it totally depends on what the workflow is like for that stuff. Yeah. And that's where we start getting into the question of, well, do we keep all the dependencies in the repo? And by that, what I mean is that like, um, you don't just store the lock file and like the composer lock file and the, the composer.json file, but like basically everything that's in the vendor directory or whatever might be in the node modules directory or, um, or same thing with Ruby and, and, and so on and so forth. And like, um, and, and people get conflicted on it because I, I remember when I worked at card, we explicitly stored everything in the repo. And when I've done the stuff for the site I'm demoing today, which is Southwest Law, we store everything in the repo. And there are pros and cons to that, right? So one thing that's, one pro to storing everything in the repo is that deployment is really easy, right? You don't need to have a separate build server that builds the stuff out, or you don't need to have it happen live on the server. And let's say you start running it, and then 30 to 40 minutes later, it says, out of memory, can not build it. And you're just like, well, shit what do I do at this point, right? You don't run into those kinds of issues. And then you also don't need to rely on a dependency being up. So like, let's say if Composer went down or one of the mirrors went down or any of that stuff, well, you can't do a deploy then, right? Because something else is, is deploying that stuff. But the issue that you run into is that you get repos that are, you know, maybe 10 times the size they're supposed to be because they have every single version of the library in there. And again, this goes for, for Node as well, like imagine, especially with Node, it's like, um, because some of those dependencies change really frequently and like you have, it's so easy to have like 500, 600 meg repos for that stuff and, and just kind of ballooning out of control from there for this stuff. And I, I don't want to just, I'm not trying to just shit on JavaScript. Like I'm saying that this is a common issue with anything that deals with this kind of stuff. Um, and then the other thing might also be that you know, if you have multiple people working on the project and they're all changing like the composer and composer.lock file to go with it, that means they might be changing all the stuff in that vendor repo. It's like, well, this is going to be a nightmare to untangle if there are conflicts with that stuff. And luckily, like, at least when I worked at CARD, even though we had like a, um, we had a 10 person engineering team, like we didn't really run into those issues. It happened once maybe six months, realistically once in a year. But when it happened, it just sucked. It, it truly sucked. But at the same time, like once, once a year problem is better than dealing with some of the other things. And on the flip side is that if you don't include the vendor directory or the node modules directory or, and, and so on and so forth, your repos aren't really bloated, right? It's just your code and and that's the end of the day. You're going to have your composer install and your NPM install take care of the rest of it. So you're really only left with um, conflicts possibly in your lock file for that stuff. Which again, some places commit that and some places don't. So it, it really depends with that thing. But the flip side of it, again, is it, it's, it's, it's the exact opposite problem which, which you deal with when stuff is in the repo. Um, your dependencies need to be up, meaning that they need to be downloadable from, from NPM or from, from Composer and its mirrors and stuff like that. Um, you actually end up having a deployment workflow at that point as well, right? Because then you have to have this intermediary or you need to have like this separate folder where all of this stuff gets installed and, and set up and all of that and basically creating an artifact. And especially if you're not using a lock file, your dependencies could change and that could royally, royally fuck you up. Like, um, even when I had a lock file, I tried to jump just one minor version of a module and I was trying to get it installed and it just crashed the site completely. And it's just like, what the, what the fuck happened at this point? And I'm, I'm, I don't know if, uh, uh, Stoffer's kid is here. I'm sorry. I'm going to stop swearing. I, I, I promise at this point. I just realized that. <laughs> but um, 
you know, it can, you can be really screwed from, from this whole thing. And so, you know, what do you, and, and so the, those are the kinds of things that you just need to think about when you're dealing with this. Like if you have a team, you can, you, you need to talk with the team on how you're going to be dealing with this scenario. And if you're a one person um, shop and that's what happens with me when I'm consulting on some sites, it's like, well, I'm just going to go at this in a really ham fisted way for some of this stuff. And I think that's why Rick was really interested in me talking about this because, and I don't know how much this will help other people just because it's like, it's a really, I, I, I kind of just go at this with a, with a, with a jackhammer essentially or, uh, that some people might think, but we can talk about the different ways we can, we can approach these kinds of problems. Right. Well, just, just for some perspective for anybody who might be new to this and might just be thinking, well, so what should I or should I not include? Is there any kind of best practice? I don't know, but I can share with you that we absolutely do not commit our vendor folder, right. but, we, but we commit everything else, all the modules, everything. So when I do a composer require a new module, that becomes part of my Git repo. I mean, I, I could easily share my screen at any time and show you everything that's included because anything that's in Git ignore is not gonna show up in that screen, right? It's in my mm -hmm. in my IDE. So just to answer, just to give anyone who might be kind of new to this some perspective, our site's pretty big, you know, and it, it and it we pretty much commit everything. We just want it all in the repo. Now I don't find that to be particularly problematic. Right. Now, I don't have a lot of comparison, but anyway, I just I'd throw that out there for perspective. Right. And and to your point on that, so like you can take different things that you want in your repo too. So like you could have the, some people might not have the vendor directory like you said, but we'll have the contrib modules directory in the repo. Mm -hmm. And some places will not even do that. Like it will just be, this is the code that we wrote and that's the stuff that's gonna be in the repo and nothing else is going to be a part of that. Which again, it's, it's you, you can go into all sorts of extremes with this stuff. It's like everything in the repo and nearly nothing but custom code in the repo. And so, and so, and then you have the scale in between of what do I want in there? Do I want my node modules in there, which might take up a, a lot of, um, a lot of um, repository space or, or hard disk space. Uh, and similarly with Compo Composer, which might also take up a lot of hard disk space, but you know, it, so it's going to offer me some flexibility. Would it be so, safe to assume that the benefit of doing that is you're keeping your repo nice and trim and clean but if you hire a vendor or or outsource something to a, a developer you're reliant entirely on making sure that your you know that your composer json or composer lock file is going to make absolutely sure that when they fire up their local environment they're going to have the same environment that you're running on production right mm -hmm. yeah okay yeah all i right. mean I, all of this stuff goes with have really good notes for for yeah. anyone that's onboarding yeah, a hell of a readme file. To, a hell of a readme file or like have some shell scripts that they, you know, just need to do like a one liner into to doing the stuff. And, and I mean, if we're using Lando, then obviously all of this stuff can get simpler as well. So like, you know, there, there are tons of things that you can do to make developer life easier. But we all, but with all of these, we just need to be able to try and make sure that our individual environments are as close to being similar to each other as possible. And so like if everything's in the repo, well, everyone's going to be kind of be on the same page. If it's using the lock files then everyone is most likely going to be on the same page. If there's no lock file, well, there might be differences. And, you know, so those are, those are the fundamental questions that you have to ask as a team for this stuff. And okay. along with like, how are we deploying this? If like, if, if we don't have a way to be able to run Com Composer install on the server, it's like, well, we got to commit everything. There's, we just don't have a choice at that point versus if we have a build server it's like hey let's build it out there and then we'll do an r sync to to the server and i do that with the slack bot for example like the slack bot um has just my custom code and a composer.json and lock file and so whenever i do updates like the composer.json file gets an update the lock file gets an update um, and then on gitlab it builds out the code and then r syncs it off onto my server at that point so like that's taking an approach that's like that's pretty um like like a lot of people go down that path 
for doing this stuff. So, you know, that's, that, that, that's one way to consider all this stuff. And, cool. and, and yeah, with, with the Southwest loss thing, it's like, well, everything is in the code repo for that one. Cause it's like, I just want it to be completely locked down in there for that stuff. I don't really have access to a bill. I know that Acquia offers a service to be able to build stuff out on their servers, but um, I, I, I've, at the point that we're, where things are at with the stuff, I'm happy with how stuff is working and I don't want to mess with that. Right. It's the goal is if the, if, if, if everything works, then, then don't mess with it. So anyways, there are some useful composer commands that you should know. And I mean, you probably use a bunch of these for yourself on a daily basis, but like, I, I'm just going to kind of spell those out in this case. And so like, the, the first one, the, mo the one that we're going to be using is going to be composer install. And that's going to be installing all the dependencies that you have in the composer.json file. And it'll create a composer.lock file if it does not exist. And if it does exist, then it's going to install the dependencies that are in the composer.lock file instead. And so what happens in this case is it's slow on the first install because it's trying to figure out what all your dependencies are and all of that sort of stuff. And once it's done that, it creates the lock file and then every subsequent one just knows, oh, everything is just listed out in this file that I need to actually download along with the version. I will download it and that's the end of the story. So this is generally the safest thing, operation of the bunch that you can do with this stuff. Um, when we go out of it, we get to composer update, which is going to start updating your dependencies and it, Aside from updating the dependencies, it updates the composer.lock file that you have, and it will also update the composer.json file that you have. So it's more of a destructive um, thing that it does as part of this operation. Um, also with composer install, like you can do the same thing composer, well, I should have put composer required there too, and I'll make a slide for that. But um, what you can do is you can specifically update certain libraries or modules or even Drupal core in this case. So like when 8.9.2 comes out, you could just have it update that specific thing as opposed to trying to update all of the dependencies that you have. Um, and, but at the same time, this operation is going to be slow because again, it's like, oh, I'm downloading this new dependency. I need to make sure that everything else that relies on it is going to be okay with it. And if it's not, then maybe I need to update those. And if I need to update those, then I need to update its dependencies and so on and so forth. And well, shit, Composer is slow. Sorry for swearing. And um, sorry, I think Rick has something to say. I just want to throw in, the, again, the, be the beginner's you know, perspective here because I, I, do, I still, after all these years, consider myself a beginner. And I tried running Composer update a couple times and I'd, I'll never run it again. It's just, it tries to do too much at once and it just, I've never had any success with it. It just broke so many things. It's like, if you have any custom modules, it's not really checking that. It, <laughs> I don't know. I'd it's, be really careful slow. with Composer Update, man. That, that's, a, that's one that's pretty risky. I mean, you're, you're basically telling this thing, update everything. I don't care how long it's been since I updated modules, just update everything. That's what this command tells it to do. Bring the whole damn thing up to date. Well, again, you can run Composer Update on its own, or you can run Composer Update um, you know, for a specific thing. That's so different. Like, I do that all the time, like you said, every day. But that is, you're telling it, I want to update one thing at a time. That, mm -hmm. That's a completely different thing than just running Composer Update by itself. I mean, for me on my site, that just breaks stuff. I'm just trying to remember what the uh, command was for seeing what the latest version of a module was, okay. or, or if there was an upgrade for, for something. I mean, you can do dry run, which, you know, tells you what it's going to do <laughs> before it actually makes any changes, but. Can people read what's on the terminal or should I make it bigger? I can see it. Okay. Actually, I'll make it a little bit bigger at least. There we go. 
So anyways, right now it's running composer update as just a dry run. And this is the part that, you know, is the slow part when it's updating dependencies. That's where it's trying to figure out, okay, I need to, I basically have a million pieces and I need to put them together. And if those pieces need something else, I need to get those pieces as well. So this is where things start getting slow for this stuff. And this, since that's gonna be running for a while, we can, we can move to the next, uh, next piece. Um, this is a, a very useful thing to know, uh, Composer Y. And what that lets you do is like, let's say you're running your Composer update or even Composer install when there's no lock file. Sometimes you'll run into an issue of can't install. And then you're just like, well, this sucks. And what you can do is you can type Composer Y along with whatever it is that it was not able to install. And then it'll kind of start giving you a list of what happened or, or why it's not able to install that stuff. So it could be like a PHP dependency or it could be, um, it could be a million other things, but so like you can type Drupal slash Drupal or Drupal slash core, I think. And so like when I type that, like I can see like there are a bunch of things that are in here that depend on it. And we can see that like um, for the version of Drupal that I'm looking at, it requires at least 8.8.8 .8 of lightning and, and so on and so forth. And it can also start going into PHP dependencies and stuff like that for it. So it's a, it's a useful command to know some of this stuff. But the biggest thing, oh, and there's composer validate. And this helps validate the composer file. So um, it lets you know if your dependencies are really locked down. And so, so if I run it here, you'll see a bunch of stuff in here that comes up. And it's just going to shoot some yellow text out there for all this stuff. And so like it says, my Acquia Lightning is like an, it's, it's pinned down to an exact version in this case. So like it's pinned down to 3.4.4 or like um, better explosive filters is, trim, is pinned down to 3.0 uh, alpha six in this case. And, and like if I showed my composer.json file for, for some of that stuff, yes, it is. So like this one is pinned down completely, but like in some cases, like I have a care for some things and, and all of that stuff. And you know, since we're talking about maintaining Drupal projects, um, one of the things with this stuff is that you know, and, and you know, we at least I, I I'm happy to or not happy, you know, it, it it's a shit show, right? It's like managing Drupal and its dependencies and its libraries and all of that stuff just sucks, and it sucks times the number of sites that you have, right? If you're managing two sites, it's twice the suckage. So, you know, it, it's, it's just not fun to deal with it be, just because these sites get big. The Drupal sites have, you know, aside from core, which has its dependencies, you might have, it's, it's there was a time 10 years ago when a, the, you know, a site would have a hundred modules installed and people would be shocked. And that's just, the, that's, that's, that's below the norm today. Right, and I mean, it, it makes sense. Drupal is just a more complicated thing than was and it was ten years ago. But again, it's like if you have two hundred dependencies and those things have dependencies of their own for things, this is it can be an absolute pain in the ass to manage with some of this stuff. And I ran into it with Lightning a few years ago, and I said that Lightning is hot garbage. Do not use it and stuff like that. I just went off on on a rant on Twitter, and uh, part of me regrets it, part of me doesn't. And, um, and the big thing is that um, at the time when this stuff happened, even though Drupal started to move into using Composer, people didn't really understand um, what we were trying to do or, with Composer and what people around were doing with Composer already. And the thing, and that's why it became a big announcement in the past year of let's aim for semantic versioning for stuff. So what does that mean exactly? Um, what it means is that, you know, when you see a release that is in the format, you know, 1.0.1 or whatever for X, Y, and Z, 
it, it has a very specific meaning to it now. So the Z part of, the, of that numbering, it's basically a patch release of whatever library you're dealing with. And what that at the end of the day means is that no new functionality was added, no, new fu no functionality was removed. All that happened were bug fixes. Nothing else happened in there. Nothing else should happen in there for that stuff. Um, when, it's, when you're dealing with the middle number, the Y, it's a feature. That means new code was added in there for new functionality. But again, nothing was removed. If you're using, if you're using let's say 1.0.1 of a library and you suddenly, they came out with a release 1.1.0, you can move to 1.1.0 and you're just not using the, you might just not be using the new functionality that they provided but it's not going to break any code that you've written against that module or library and, and break your site. That's the goal with that. And when you have version X, that's, or the first number, if that number changes from one to two or, or, and so on and so forth, you're basically saying, I have removed code from this thing. I may have added all these new features that that's, that's besides the point. I have explicitly removed code and functions from this thing that you might be using and don't upgrade to it until you have made your stuff work with that new code. That's, that's the contract that you're signing for this stuff. And that's what it's supposed to mean. And the problem was when people were starting to do stuff with Drupal initially, um, when, when we started to move into using Composer and trying to understand some of the semantic versioning stuff, we weren't doing that. We weren't diligent on understanding what these numbers mean. And so like, oh, we could, you know, oh, Drupal core has deprecated these functions. I'm going to remove those from my library as well. And I'm going to release this as a patch. So, and then suddenly when you're trying to upgrade your code base and some of it might be relying on those modules that use those functions or whatever, it doesn't work. And you're just like, what just happened with this thing? And so like, I got shit on a lot on the font your face module where people would write, oh, these functions have been removed from Drupal core, add that in as a patch and make it part of version three. It's like, no, I can't do that. This has to become version four at this point because I'm basically saying anyone that's on Drupal 8.2 is not gonna be able to use the new version of, of the font your face module that comes out at that point. So basically I'm just collecting garbage in my modules until basically it's like, oh, Drupal 9 has come out. I'll make a version four of the font your face module that's going to remove all of those, all of that crufty code, replace it with the stuff that's now, you know, that's no longer um, deprecated. And then I can say, okay, if you use this version, it's going to be, it's going to work on Drupal 8.9 and Drupal 9 at this point. So like we can correctly use the semantic versioning stuff with, with the module. So those are things that you keep in mind when you're trying to manage a site at this stage. And so, you know, you, the thing that is unfortunate about this is that you kind of just have to see how a developer releases their code, right? So like if you're working with, if you're just using Drupal core, you know, you're, you're pretty much guaranteed at this point that they're using semantic versioning correctly. Um, and you should be safe on any major releases and things like that they have of their code base. Um, on the other hand, uh, if they're not using semantic versioning, you might need to look at the code. You might need to see, you know, as soon as you do the download using Composer update or install or whatever it might be, you might want to do a git diff and see, okay, what has changed in this particular module? Have I written code that's going to screw me over if I, if I upgrade this module at this point? Um, and, and this is also where, you know, if you have testing that you have locally or as part of an automated process, it can help, it can be handy for this kind of stuff. Right. So then it's like, at least, at least some of this stuff will be handled by this, this automated thing that I have running for my stuff. So those are just the kinds of things that you keep in mind for, for this thing. And, uh, yeah, I think that that was mostly the gist of the presentation with this stuff. Uh, I don't know what other deep, like, you know, we can have a conversation about how we want to, uh, on how we deal with some of this stuff more. 
but I know that one of the things that um, that Rick wanted me to point out is that one of the other nice things about Composer is that you can write your own commands for it, and it's very easy to extend to the kinds of things you might want to do. And so, like in my case, I have I have a couple of helpers that helper functions that I've written for this stuff. And so, like, um, and and what will happen is that when you type Composer on its own, like it'll list out all of the stuff that's available for you to do. And so I have a and and so my helper functions are mostly around just helping me kind of get rid of trying to deal with Composer install Composer update, and I just tend to deal with a composer install approach for my stuff. So, so what that means is that um, this, these three commands here were things that came with um, when I did composer create project using uh, for Drupal for this thing. So it came with a post install command for, for scaffolding and deploying libraries and all that stuff. But I wrote a couple of helper functions to just kind of help me do the things that I want to do. So like I have, so one of the big ones that he wanted me to say was I have one called nuke, which is basically remove the composer lock file, remove the stuff in, in the bin directory, my vendor directory, remove core and remove my contrib modules and distributions and basically any, anything that exists in the code base that I have not written, just blow it away. I don't want to remember what all those pieces were. So I made it into a command called nuke. So Like I can type this and then I'm guaranteeing myself that I'm basically starting on a fresh, um, kind, of, kind of like starting on a fresh install for this thing. And so then I can go, uh, and then I can do composer install. And then that's gonna update a billion things that exist in this whole code base or, or, or requirements that I have for this code base. And then I commit all of that stuff kind of as new for this thing. And it works because I'm a single developer for this project. Um, sorry, Rick has a question. It's not a question, actually. I just want to interject something that your nuke command if, mm -hmm. if is almost virtually the same thing that you would have to do one step at a time if you were not using Composer and didn't have a Git repo and you were maintaining, a say, a small site that ran on Drupal and, and you wanted to update core, you would have to actually do each one of those items in your nuke in order to get successfully through your upgrade to the next version of core. And yeah. Even a minor release. I mean, you have to delete those folders and those files I mean, you can in order to stuff, make it happen. You can do it using composer update. I'm just not the biggest fan no, of the I know. Function. I was just, I was Mainly just pointing out how the, cool your nuke file, your nuke command is, is that it, it basically allows you to con have direct control over upgrading core you because you can just have a, a single mm -hmm. command that just says get rid of all the crap that's going to happen if i run composer update for core only uh yeah yeah you can um and then i made a light nuke version of it which is basically keep the lock file around so um so that way uh, it's not having to re-update the dependencies and stuff. It's just kind of like, okay, there might be a problem with some of the stuff that I had, or maybe I've just not dealt with it in a while. I wanted to explicitly just download everything uh, or, or blow away some of the pieces and let me just uh, do a composer install again for this stuff and see what's maybe what's changed for some of it. Um, I found that pretty useful for doing some things. Uh, additionally, like you can pin down a version of PHP in here. So then that way, even though I have a machine that might be running PHP 7.2, it'll download the dependencies as if it was for 7.3 and vice versa. And um, yeah, and then I have my sync command in here as well. So like when I have stuff from the, the production server, I can do the drush sync in here. So I don't have to have, um, like previously I've had separate scripts that that'll do that syncing and all that stuff for me, but I can just include some of that information in my composer itself. So then that way it's all um, part of one file, essentially. Um, it, it, again, it depends on what you want the workflow to be for this stuff. But for me, at least like the new thing is just kind of helpful as a clean slate. I'm gonna just recommit my vendor and all of that stuff because that's my workflow with Southwest Law. 
in this case for them, they're not, you know, we're not paying extra for the hard disk space for the repo or anything like that. So it's a workflow that works for their scenario. And I do the exact opposite of this with the Slack bot that I have. So like if I open up, where is it? Open comma bot. So like if I open this up and we look in here, I believe, yeah, the vendor directory is discolored because I'm not committing that directory at all in this case. The only things that I commit are the stuff that comes in from Composer JSON and Composer Lock. And part of the reason that I do that in this case is because my dependencies are just that much smaller. It's like, this is, this is, where is it? Realistically speaking, uh, where is it? My dependencies, there we go. So all of the dependencies that I have in here, even though it seems like a long list, is basically just the stuff for Laravel. That's just, that's just the default stuff of it. So this list is pretty tiny compared to what a Drupal project requires. And so I don't necessarily need all of those pieces in my repo and, and then I can just let composer.lock uh, take care of the rest of it. Let me see, ah, here we go. This is my require file. So this is, these are my requirements. PHP of at least 7.2, the Lumen framework and the Slack library. That is this project. It, because it doesn't have anything really more than that, I can, I can rely on the log file for this. If it's going into having 100 dependencies, then it's like, well, that's where I'm shifting strategies and being like, I, it make, might make more sense to have all of this in, in my Git repo instead. Does that make sense for people? Like, it, it, it's, it's, I, I don't know what people learned from this other than, well, I'm even more confused than I was before I went to this thing. Thanks a wow. lot, Ashok. I, you've made people dumber as a result of this. No, no. But the idea is that like, you, if you have a team, you want to just kind of decide like, okay, how are we going to approach managing, you know, a hundred different things? Do we want everything in the repo? Because if we do, then we have full control, but these are the downsides. If we're putting in, like just the composer.lock file and, and then are we keeping the vendor and the Drupal contrib stuff or are we just keeping some of the things? So it's a, it's kind of a, it's a very, you just have to think this problem through fully. I think the approach that you take where you keep the Drupal contrib modules in your repo is pretty smart just because then you, um, at a bare minimum, when you do a git diff, you can at least see, okay, this is what's changed in this module. And, um, you know, if you're reviewing, it's like, oh, this thing is going to break something that we have. And then we have a way to be able to revert it back if we need to. So, yeah, different things that you think about for that stuff. And anyways, that, that was, I think that was the end of my slides. I didn't even have a, the end or questions or anything. It was just a, oh, shit, I got to get this thing ready. And uh, this, is, this is where we are. So, uh, yeah, blah, well, blah, blah. I think we have plenty of time for questions, but before we jump into questions, I just want to say that, um, well, first thing I want to say is I misquoted when I said you had to follow all the steps in your nuke file, because I, I noticed later that your nuke file also deletes all the contrib modules. That's absolutely not necessary to update, update core. But, but, it, but with that said, I want to say that the slide that you gave on um, versioning, on semantic versioning, Mm -hmm. that's my takeaway. If I learned nothing else tonight, that was absolutely worth every minute of my time because I've been actually, I have misunderstood semantic versioning until tonight, even though I actually read an article about it once. <laughs> so your description yeah, yeah. of that, your little example that you gave was so effective for me. I was like, oh man, I've misunderstood what semantic versioning is all this time. So thank you for that one slide, if nothing else. <laughs> I remember like for contrib modules, like we were missing that last thing for years, like for, for, you know, since, I mean, since when did we start actually providing semantic versioning for contrib modules? Was it Drupal 8.8? .8? So it's like, you know, we're talking about within the last year that contrib modules can finally have that patch release for realsies. And 
And so people just kind of tacked everything into this, this middle thing. And, but, you know, again, you don't fully understand how you're supposed to be doing this stuff and you download a module. It's like, shit, it doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? And you're, you're just kind of screwed. I remember organic groups. That's, that was like, they had a release a long time ago and basically the whole site that I had would break from trying to upgrade organic groups to the next patch release that it had because they removed like functionality around permissions for it. And so it was, yeah, that site is, is going to be stuck on this old ass release of organic groups just because I can't do anything else about it. So, um, yeah, it's, I got a better understanding of semantic versioning stuff last year when someone else presented on it for their stuff. I was like, this totally makes sense. Why aren't we doing this? So, yeah. And on that note, uh, any composer questions out there? Questions or comments for that matter. Yeah. I know the, the stuff was light on the composer part or on composer commands part, as opposed to the, and, and same with the managing as opposed to being ranting about other stuff, but uh, yeah. that's exciting. Yeah, but I think that what's, what's really good about what you did though is, is you really helped anybody who doesn't really understand what composers for, or any package man, manager for that matter, understand you know, the benefits, the pros and cons of them, because trying to get down into the commands is like really getting into the weeds. There's just so many commands, you know, and plus you yeah. can write your own, like you said. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how much of that, I'll tell you what I would like. I mean, what I, it, you know, again, I don't want to speak for others because everybody's, you know, needs different, is missing different parts of their education or whatever, their skill sets at whatever. But for me, a, a huge piece of it is, is how it all ties together with Git and, and your repo and, you know, meaning that for me, one of the hardest parts of it was to learn was not necessarily how to learn a few composer commands to, to, to get my site updated or my modules updated and to get it to work. That was actually fairly easy to learn, but was not easy to learn is wrapping my head around the whole workflow process of having multiple developers working on the same site without mm -hmm. accidentally, you know, causing regressions and things of that nature. Right. And so fully understanding the workflow of how to use your Git repo and, and how to, once you do development locally, how you can get that to production without stepping on anything anybody else is working on and how everybody else can then, after you update a module, how they can then use Composer or, I'm sorry, they can use Git to pull the code from from your, you know, whatever your repo or from an environment or whatever and um and and keep their stay in sync basically so that you know things don't get out of sync and developers don't cause regressions and whatnot i right. think that whole workflow you know from an entry level standpoint for people it would be really great to, to like to piggyback this with right so now everybody understands composer but seeing a whole workflow from end to end would be really great well so let's i mean let's talk about that Right, so uh, I'll talk about the the way we dealt with it when I was at Card, and so what we would do, and, and again, like we had people on the team that were part of the security team for Drupal, so like you know we we kind of had um, we were kind of on top of making sure that modules and libraries and all that stuff were kept up to date. So what we would do is you know Drupal would have its patch days on the Wednesdays, like whenever there were security releases for things. In our case, we had a whole bunch, we had a ton of custom code that we had written for our app. And so what we would do is, if people are working on a particular feature that's going to touch on some libraries that they either need or need updating, like they'll be the ones that kind of steer in the direction of updating like our dependencies that are in there. So kind of like what I'm doing with Southwest Law, which is like doing the composer install and all that stuff, like they would handle that. And then as part of their PR, like they will have the, the vendor directory that gets its updates along with composer lock and composer JSON and stuff like that. Like that person's PR would, pull request would handle that stuff. 
everyone else, for the most part of, of the stuff that we were working on, like no one was actually dealing with like managing the dependencies. We're writing custom code for this stuff. So like people would be writing the custom code and just making sure that everything works and, you know, writing tests to make sure that everything is working as the ticket and all of that stuff for it, for it as laid out. And so like, you know, you look at some people's peer pull requests, it's like, it's maybe a hundred lines of code because it's not touching, it's not requiring to touch anything in composer and in composers ecosystem for that stuff. If there was someone doing that, it's like, okay, that person is going to handle it and no one's, we're going to try and avoid stepping toes basically that way. Um, if you have multiple people that are constantly dealing with composer dependencies and things like that, then they need to have a top that basically says, look, I'm working on this thing. Let me do my stuff first. You could maybe work on something else that's not touching composer or any of the, any of the dependencies there. And, you know, we can, then we can merge our stuff in successfully without someone being like, well, shit, I need to rebuild this whole thing again and, and going through that painful process. And then, you know, then the next person is like, okay, now that your stuff is in, now let me put in my stuff and maybe it, it results in, you know, some minor changes to the composer JSON file and all that stuff at that point. But, you know, you key part here that I'm saying is conversation with anyone else that you're working with. So you can't just go at it like, okay, I'm assigning these two people, these two tickets, they're going to work in parallel. They're both going to have pull requests at the same time and then they're, they're just going to get magically merged in somehow. And it's all just going to work. It's like, yeah, that might be the case, but it might not. So, you know, have that conversation is the, is a key part. And if you're doing all of the stuff solo, then, then you can do whatever you want at that point. And like, you can have the, uh, what is it? So if I did a get status here, you can have the billion different things that this has changed and, and commit that into a repo at that point. But yeah, it's a, uh, it's a conversation to have with the team and how you're going to, you know, as you're putting in tickets into your sprint or even if it's in Kanban or whatever, like structure it so that people are not going to be butting heads or stepping on toes or any of that stuff. Like it, it definitely dives into the project management side of things um, for that kind of stuff. Does that make sense for people or? I don't know if we want to do a, a demo workflow for this. It makes perfect sense. Okay. No, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. And, and those are good caveats to call out. Yeah. Oh, Drupal dependencies. I mean, you know, workflow it's, it's a, where there are workflow dependencies, it's like any big project. It's like, and this is where we get into the, um, you know, there, there are pros and cons of using um, whether open source or otherwise libraries that other people have built for this stuff, right? It's like you're, you're not writing that code or you've not written that code, so you're saving time that way, but you are at the mercy of what happens when they release some new code at that point. So um, you just have to figure out how you want to deal with it at that point. Um, yeah, like at card, we, we weren't using views. We were using a whole bunch of mod, like modules that people traditionally use for their websites. Most of it was just Drupal core. And then we had like, I think 20, 30,000 lines of custom code that, that did all of the other stuff that we wanted. So it was just a, that, that was a a conscious decision that was made for that stuff. Very cool. Well, thank you for the demo. I think it was great oh, for the presentation. Yeah, nice. I'd, I'd like to actually ask a quick question where I could see a show of hands. If, if you're done, go ahead and stop sharing your screen so I can see the grid of everybody's faces. Sure. Well, I don't actually need to see faces, but I, I would like to ask a kind of, you know, show of hands kind of question. So I don't know how you guys want to answer this if you got your video turned off, but I am actually, I, I want to take this opportunity actually, especially after that last little kind of tidbit you threw in there, which was really good. Um, I want to mention that we are actually planning another, uh, add a, a second meetup since we're doing them online. I, I kind of felt 
that and I, you know, I propose this to the rest of the organizers, you know, why are we just only doing one a month? These are so great. I mean, I don't know about everybody else. I'm going freaking stir crazy. I, for me, I look forward to this night, man. It's like, why, why do it once a month? Why not do it every two weeks? And, you know, maybe no one will show up. Maybe they will. I don't know. And so the suggestion was, well, let's do it, but let's keep it pretty casual. You know, let, let's, it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't have to be technical. It doesn't have to be casual. It can just be whatever, so but let's a, not. Uh, there's a level of casual with this. Uh, you broke up a little bit. Say that again. You froze. There's a level of casual below this one because I thought well, we were pretty laid back. We're pretty laid back, but let's face it. If you were a true noob, to Drupal and you, and you didn't really know much about Git or Composer or Symfony or any of that technology, this would have been a, not exactly an entry level presentation. I mean, I, I was able to follow every word because, you know, I've been at it now for 10 years, but I, you know, I mean, there was, there's, there's still plenty of it I don't understand. And, and so the point of the other meeting meetup is it doesn't, you know, it, it's an opportunity for everyone to just shoot the breeze because by the time this thing ends at nine o'clock, some of us have kids and stuff like that. And it's kind of like, we're done, you know? Um, this is like, let's start right off with, with cocktails and, and just, you know, talk about whatever, just, you know. However, I mean, that does not mean it doesn't have to have any knowledge sharing at all. I mean, uh, part of my motivation for suggesting it in the first place was to keep it really entry level. You know stuff that most of the most of the people that are you know that I know in the in the LA Drupal community would not be interested in sitting through a, a session on because it's like are you kidding me? You know we're not going that far backwards, are we? But I say yeah, why not? I mean there's plenty of people that haven't really used any of it yet, you know, and they and they're interested in doing it, so why not? We don't have to make a whole night of it, you know. We could make it a casual and and maybe you know. Like I was just talking about a minute ago, like I would be more than happy to demonstrate a, a typical day in the life for me, you know, fire up my local environment. I can even go over how the hell I, I set that up and, and, you know, make a real simple change to some, you know, twig file and commit that to my repo and go through my integration between GitHub and my environments so that it creates a dev environment on my on my platform and and go through the you know committing that and merging that commit and and you know and then reverse it so that i can start over i'm a new developer i'm going to pull my upstream dev so that i can get my local environment in sync with something that someone just committed yesterday i mean that's a lot of workflow for people to learn from scratch and for, i gotta tell you i struggled with that because i didn't have anyone to ask so anyway, that's part of the motivation for another meetup. I wanted to throw that out there. It doesn't have to be an, a lesson thing. It can just be completely casual, but I did want to announce it because we're planning to do it, you know, on the last Tuesday of the month instead of the, the second Tuesday like this one is. So just throwing that out there for anybody interested. And I would appreciate it actually, if there is anybody here tonight that is, you know, kind of newish and thinks that that's really great and actually says, yeah, I would love to see you cover this because I don't know anything about it and I, I would love to get started with that. Throw those suggestions up there on Slack and that would be great for us. Or if you're not on the Slack channel, do that first, but then you can also shoot me an email if you want. <laughs> anyway, but now I'd like to actually open up the floor for any more questions or comments about anything that's been discussed tonight or what have you. Or it's time to open a beer, <laughs> if you haven't already. <laughs> no, that was that was a nice view into Stokes process and uh, and methodology, and um, I'm always the first to speak up and say I do appreciate code that has uh, the quality of what we used to call in math elegance, and that it's the least number of lines to perform the most number of th actions, um, and especially with your you know, your your nuke label and such. Yeah, that's just smart coding, smart thinking. Yeah, I, um, no, I, I do the same thing in, in file processing and database processing. So uh, you'll, you'll see a file lab labeled delete, and that's like the, the trash can just before the trash can where I park right. things. And when I'm ready, I go, yeah, just yeah, I don't have to go survey it. I'm ready to just uh, do the whole thing. So, mm -hmm. um, and that goes to thinking about how you comment your code, how you document your code, 
and that goes to the workflow for the, yeah, I've got two, pro two guys processing the tickets, you need to talk to each other, and I need you to learn a common vocabulary so that those scrum skills build up and we get faster, that's the whole point. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of that is, is right there in the heart of everything you're doing. I really appreciate that. Um, Rick, I like your idea of, of more, uh, more meetups. And if I were to channel my inner Chris, uh, I'm going to hear him saying, got to get an audience for that. So, you know, we got to funnel people in. Well, we got one volunteer. Look at the chat. Cool. We got one in already. I, and I'm, I, too. I, I, I'm, I'll be, I'll be down to, to attend, that's for sure. But um, I'm also mindful of so many of Ashok's comments over the last 18 months. Drupal's changed. It's not as easy to jump in as a beginner, show up at meetups, pick up the, the basic skills of HTML and Java and move on. It's not that animal anymore. Chris and Ashok right. are right. And, and there's, there's been some pain points in that. And that's what we've seen in the failures and losses of some of the, the Drupal camps where you could get this kind of training, but that was five years ago. Yeah. So I, I, I think everyone's right, and I've been looking for an answer to that very question for two years as I see the demise of Drupal camps around the country, and I think it's a real shame that we need to update the brand and the message and the channel to sell this and get bodies in chairs in the meetups, in Drupal camps, uh, to, so, because that's an indicator that people see themselves in the product, in the capability, in the career going forward. Uh, I think that's really important. Otherwise, it's more work for all of us. Well, thank you for that. And I will say I that. Mean, I, I meant by more job security, not, 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 not more bad no, work, well, more good well, work. You know, to your point, though, I think that's part of the motivation why the organizers are telling me I wouldn't put the focus on Drupal, at least not initially. If it, go, if it goes in that direction, fine. I, I'd keep it more just Agree. open, open conversation. Look, there's more to, there's more to this world for all of us than just Drupal anymore. Yeah. You know, I, James, I, I know kind of your background. So I, I, and I can tell you that my job on a daily basis moves more in the direction of your job than it does a Shooks or Tommy's or, or, or any of these other guys. I, I'm much more, my job is moving much more towards project management, consultation, problem solving, and I, I'm lucky if I actually get to see a command line at the end of the day anymore. It, it, it's just getting tough for me. I, I, I'm, I need more developers. So there's nothing wrong with sitting around and, and everybody no. just shooting the breeze about anything. It doesn't have to be. That, that was kind of the point of it, is that if yeah. we're going to do this, let's have one night be really technical where everybody learns some deep dive in something. And the other night, well, if there's learning involved, great, but it doesn't have to be, right? Let's just talk. Right. Let's just talk about the industry. Let's talk about Drupal. Right. Let's talk about Laravel. Let's talk about JavaScript. Let's talk about whatever, you know, or let's just talk about what your favorite beer is or your favorite bourbon. But it's, it's networking. It's networking in the community yeah. and it's mindful of our roots in yeah. open source and, and being mindful of the opportunity of discovery of what's the next, next gear to find in open source that's going to do the next thing and unlock. It's like, hey, wait a minute. We put the Legos together in this way. We can do this. No one thought of that before. This is how you do it. Yeah. So, so I fully support it. Cool. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I'm ready for a drink. So if, uh, if I may excuse myself for about uh, 45 seconds, I'm going to go do that, and I'll be right back. <laughs> Uh, on that same idea, um, do we have any preliminary ideas or thoughts about Drupal Camp LA? Or has that been discussed and I missed it? Um, In-person is not happening for obvious just, reasons. Right. But, um, I mean, someone would need to spearhead something online, basically, for, for how we want to approach this. I know, I mean, Bad Camp is doing it online. We have seen camps that are doing it online. So it's a matter of how someone has to spearhead it. I think like I'm just, I'm busy with other stuff. So I've just not really paid attention into or tried to push or even prod at John for trying to do something for this year. But if someone else wants to try and take on some of that stuff, then 
I'm fine it with that. Drupal Camp in Colorado. Um, I registered right. it. Um, it's in August, but um, I haven't heard back on them. I don't know if they got the sessions in, but I'm just waiting for mm -hmm. them. And I might go to that one. That one is free. It's on online on Zoom. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, uh, yeah, I know there was a Midwest camp that happened a few months ago at this point that that seemed to have gone pretty well from everything that I'd heard. Um, yeah. I think right now the best bet is just like find like these band camps or Colorado or places like that. It's going to be too hard to start one in LA, but I think like I was telling earlier, like these meetups in a way, they're kind of like Drupal camp. So we can continue having these Zoom meetups, which is really good and useful information. Mm -hmm. So I've got a, a little bit of a separate question that's kind of similar to the Drupal Camp question. Um, if you guys were going to run a conference that had nothing to do with software people, but just a normal conference, but you wanted a lot of the same features as what we have on the Drupal Camp LA site, what would you use to build that? Because I could have swore that there was some distribution out there that kind of did this. But I don't honestly remember what it is. And when you search for, you know, open source convention software, yeah, that doesn't. Is it it's Drupal Commons? Or COD. COD Commons? used to be the thing. Was it? Yeah, that's what it was. COD. Yeah. Was it called Open COD? What, uh, what John just Common? posted Conference Organizing Distribution. That's COD. Oh, sorry. So, um, what's the functionality that you specifically that you like so much for for running a conference site? Ah, uh, there it is, right there. Conference organizing distribution. Um, yeah. Uh, basically, there's a, a decent chance that uh, my little sister, who a couple of you know, uh, may end up running a <coughs> online organic farming convention. Wow. Okay. So evidently uh, it was canceled for February and she calls me up and says, if I take a job as an executive director to plan the conference, can you tell me what the hell I'm supposed to do with regards to <laughs> software? And I was like, well, you know, I'm pretty sure there's probably some like, you know, open source software out there that can actually do it. Cause I know we do use stuff for Drupal camp, you know, but, uh, I am noticing that this COD is, uh, seven is D seven. Not yeah. that that would be the end of the world for this. 2022. What? 2022. You yeah. it's, it's, it's good for two years at least. That is true. That is true. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, she's still uh, kind of interviewing for the job, but mm -hmm. from what she claims, it's kind of like a shoe-in because three of her friends are on the board of directors. <laughs> I mean, so, like, what's the plan with the soft? Like, what makes it different from a tech conference? Like, from nuts and bolts kind of a thing, oh, right? Oh, um, honestly, very, very little. Uh, I mean, what, what I was kind of making up to her the other day is that if you had the concept of sessions and stuff like that set up, you know, you could in theory just provide a Zoom or a go-to meeting or something like that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, for each one of the individual conference rooms, you know, that you would normally have. So say you have three tracks or five tracks, then you just really have to pay for like, you know, three or five Zoom accounts for a month. So it's not like that is really that big of a deal. And then you just, you know, do the same kind of call for papers stuff that we do, you know, or call for presenters that we do, you know, and yeah. the only real difference is that we're not talking about software. We're talking about, I don't know, crop rotation. <laughs> exactly. Like there's no, talking about. yeah, it, it's, I mean, I worked on the scale site, which was just, you know, just had a ton of sessions going on at the same time, but it's like, is it really different from a, from a Drupal camp? No, it's, it's exactly the same stuff. They're all looking for the exact same things, yeah. having the camps, maybe having some social events that are happening and um, ways for people to be able to register, maybe pay for stuff and 
and whatnot. So yeah. um, what I'd be really, I mean, so Johan's not here now. He had mentioned that like Zoom has an API for like do. doing stuff. Um, and I know that there's Amazon Chime as well. And Chime is basically like a Zoom competitor, which yeah. also has an API, which you can let, use to create like dynamic rooms and stuff like that. Sure. And so like, I'm, I'm, I'd be interested in seeing like maybe having a way that people can, you know, start session or what, or join session or whatever, right from within their browser for, for some of this kind of stuff. I know you can do it with Jitsi for sure, but Jitsi mm -hmm. is iffy on quality of it. Whereas we Zoom used... and uh, Chime are pretty consistent. We well, used I... something different for uh, Drupal Camp Asheville this past weekend. And I think DrupalCon is using it too this week. I, I'm trying to find the email that gives me the name. Um, it worked well for the features you're asking about, Chris, and that we, you know, separate rooms, easy to join, um, moderator controlled. Uh, and I can't find the name. I, th I think it's, I want to say Hoopla, but I don't think that's right. You can definitely do, you know, breakout rooms and all that with, yeah. with Zoom, but, but the, how, I don't, I haven't really used it much, so I don't know how easy it is to jump from room to room and all that. But I, I do know that moderators can absolutely control who's in what break room, but, um, but yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know much further about it than that. I mean, one of the things that she did say that I thought was kind of fascinating uh, is normally they have around 3,000 attendees, but they, okay. if they do it virtual, it could be more like 15,000. Uh, and the reason is, is because not like we have any farmers here, but uh, yeah, when you're a farmer, it's not like you get to like leave the farm for three days to like go stay in a hotel room and do the conference. Because your animals die when you're gone, <laughs> you know. So they don't. You don't really do that. So they were actually kind of joking about how, you know, if they actually did run it virtual, that attendance might actually go through the roof, because a lot of people do want to show up and learn the information and the and the techniques and stuff like that, but they just can't leave the farm. So this is kind of the best of both worlds to a certain extent. My family had a farm. True story. Yep. I do remember that actually. But is is part of the problem the preparation before the day of? Is is that part was that part of your question about do no, you need a I mean, do you need a site where, you know, you can put up all the various sessions and so people can kind of register for sessions and whatnot? Yeah, I mean that was honestly really the onus is like how do you register for sessions? You know, how do you, you know, get session submissions to come in, you know, when people propose sessions? And then, you know, do you have the ability to, you know, turn it into a schedule and a grid of who's talking in what room? Yeah. And yeah, yeah. I mean, it, I, I, I like what Ashok was saying earlier about the fact that, you know, you could do all this, you know, automated through a Zoom API. But I mean, realistically, if you're talking about, uh, let's say 50 sessions, I'd probably just pay an intern to go do it by hand, <laughs> you know, or go, go, go. Well, the, I, the idea with this would be that you have something that's flexible that can be used for other, ah, uh, yeah. other, um, events basically. Sure. So like that can become something, it can become something more, but yeah, I mean, it's like you get the zoom business plan. It gives you 10 hosts. You, that basically means you can have 10 sessions going on at any given time. So you're, you're kind of done there. Well, I'm sitting here looking at Zoom conference module for eight. So mm -hmm. evidently it already exists. You know, it's just a question of. How uh, well does it work? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> pretty much. Pretty much. The name but, of the app we used was Hopin. Hopin? Uh, it, was, it was new to me. Online venue for virtual events. I mean, okay. as far as the website goes, you know, and, and as far as displaying the, the any um, from Adobe. sessions and whatnot, I mean, you know, you definitely have a, a couple of resources right here in the room. I mean, the virtual room 
I mean, you've got the, you, you do have the, you know, access to what's, what was done on the scale site and you have access, you know, to what was done on the LA Drupal meetup site. Cause they both have some of that functionality right in, right there. I've that, that's a, a, assuming that this COD thing, whatever you guys found isn't already, you know, perfect. Well, COD, COD does a lot of what they're talking about. This is kind of interesting. Uh, the hop in software. Just pay for it, call it a day. I mean, you know, it's um, funny because we, we have. Case, honestly, a show. Pardon? Pay for it and call it a day. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's the, you know, that's, that's the difference honest, between yeah. a junior developer and a senior, right? It's like, uh, well, we could spend uh, a month on it or just pay for it and call it a day. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of <laughs> one of the things that was going on in my head when I started clicking on this hop. Yes. Yeah. You don't want you don't want to reinvent the wheel if 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 it's if it's ex, if it's inexpensive to just use the wheel, you know. <laughs> yeah. And that that was the problem is for fifteen thousand people. Right, when she was calling me and asking, Pardon? This, is I thought you know I mean I I know that the LA Drupal Camp website was built with some sort of open source distribution. I thought. Uh, so you guys actually rolled <laughs> that all your own. I didn't know that. Yeah, that was mostly um, this by them with John. Yeah, it was um, it was originally built by uh, Blake at this by them. Oh, really? And then, uh, oh, yeah. and then I ported it up to Drupal Seven. Mm -hmm. Oh wow! I did I did not remember that. I thought it was uh, the COD the whole time. No, there were. Serious issues with COD at the time, from what I remember, John. Sure. You were going to interject something, but you, you stopped. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> I was going to say, for thousands of people, you're probably going to need to pay some money to, uh, to oh, use some and, of these platform yeah. services. It surprised me at all. I mean, being Serious cool, money. Sarah, Sarah knows that this isn't going to be free. <laughs> you know, yeah, uh, yeah. But when if, you really start thinking about comparing, like the price that you know s someone like us would charge to set this up and get oh, it yeah. working, yeah, it's still probably nowhere near the amount they would have had to pay for a convention center. Oh yeah, right, yeah. exactly. Oh, it's, it's not even you, in the same dimension. You can look into. We've used that. Uh, it's called Sked. Um, it's just scheduling software, so it just provides a. a uh, an easy, cheap way to have um, if you have a multi-day conference. So sort of put up a schedule. Uh, sched S C H E D. Oh, I spell that. And then you can use it in conjunction with like Zoom. <clears throat> so again, it really depends on on what their budget is. But for a couple of grand, it sounds like it could make it work. Sure. And a few interns to enter that content. So. Cool. Well, something I'm sure my little sister appreciates the help. I do. Now we just got to see if she actually gets the job. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking at the pricing for, uh, for Hopin, and it's like, I mean, it's expensive, but at the same time, if it's a conference where people are paying, and like you said, if they're paying for venue and stuff like that, it's, it's Where cheap. do you see pricing, Ishuk? Let me see if I can send it. One sec. I just typed in hop in pricing for uh, into oh, Google. I just found it too. Yeah. So not to change the subject, but I am curious what what everybody's doing to uh, maintain sanity during this freaking pandemic, which doesn't want to end. Making you think I'm videos? still saying that's so cute. I really appreciate that, Rick. Thank you what, so much. What's that? You think I'm still sane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, I really that, appreciate that, that Thank you. sailed a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my, my wife and I are planning to get out of the house for uh, a break between semesters and uh, we will be uh, having an epic road trip and we've been doing uh, more gardening than ever and um, 
uh, if I've, I've got my hands on projects and to, you know, to do lists or the, the screw gun and I have uh, been close friends. I, so I can relate. Like, yeah. Like turning wrenches on your El Camino, man. Yep. Yep. And the screw gun is definitely getting a workout. I can tell you that. Yep. Projects, projects, projects. But I, I, I have heard that gardening, the uptick in guard, home gardening is so intense that providers of, of, you know, soils and mulches and all that stuff that they, they're, they're struggling to keep up because, you know, that people are doing it, you know, that's what they're doing. And can't find uh, terracotta pots. Everybody's yeah. sold out. Yeah. But my wife's been into it for years. So for her, it was just kind of, you know, keeping on, keeping on. You know, but she said, yeah, when I go to the nursery to get plants, though, she's like, wow, <laughs> it's like, I, there's no place to park. And it's like, you're scared to go in there because it's like, I'm not supposed to be with that many people, you know. So she's like there when they open now and grabs her stuff and gets out before the crowd shows up. And she said, and the, they're thin pickings because, you know, it's really popular right now. That That's that's funny because, I mean, I have my projects. Oh, my God, I have enough projects to last me a lifetime. So I don't have any issues, but very curious what others are doing, you know. I've had the time to do some um, slow cooking for Cajun cooking. It takes me about six hours to put together a, a good batch of jambalaya. There you and, go. Um, take half of it over to the in-laws, and we have a social oh, distancing uh, bonfire. Yeah. How far so, away from me do you live? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm close enough. Bring, bring a bowl. Yeah. I, I have to give some of it away because when I make six quarts at a time, it's tempting to eat it all. I drive a long way for, for jambalaya, bro. I'll, I'll, I'll wear two masks and a face shield. I'll Come save you some. You. Yeah. Anybody doing any, you know, uh, more like athletic things, start take up jogging, start riding a bicycle, any of that going on? I've been riding uh, my bike all over the place, Rick. Yeah, like, I literally get on the bike with Warren, and we've been driving or riding all the way down to the beach and back on the side streets. Like, in nice. I swear to God, dude, you, I could cross Sepulveda Boulevard without waiting for the light. It was a trip. Like, just complete nutbags. And there's still, as long as you're on the side streets, there's still no cars on the side nice. streets. So, I don't know. Lots nice. Of, lots of bike riding lately. Yeah, yeah us too. Uh, that, that helps keep us sane, getting out on the bikes at least two days a week. Yep. Yeah, I take a little short bike ride in the evenings after this, a stressful day at the Zoom office. Yeah. Hey, Ashok, I did see that that was 18 grand basically for an enterprise license yeah. for, uh, for hopping. That doesn't sound bad at all. For a year. So, I mean, you could have other events that happen in a year for other stuff. Again, yeah. it, it's, it's a... It's That's a, not a bad price at all. I mean, when you think about... What when a conference costs a million bucks, let's say, 18000 is nothing in the grand scheme of things for one. And B, oh, yeah. again, it's like you can use it for other stuff. It, 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 yeah. 3,000 attendees is $6 each. <laughs> yeah. I can't think of many things. I, sorry. I was just going to say, I can't think of many things I wouldn't attend because six bucks was too much to spend. Well, I'm, I, mean, I'm pretty sure that I think I'd spend six bucks to come to this meetup. <laughs> I mean, how much, I mean, farmers spend a shit ton of money on equipment. Like six bucks is a drop in the bucket. It's, the dude, it's nothing. But, I mean, you, know, you do have to remember too. That's to break even, but you know, I even mean, if it, it is, was I get it, 20 but bucks, I'm just yeah. saying. Yeah. Yeah. But no, I farmers I'm that are in her circle of friends are more in the organic farming group. They're more like, uh, well, let's just call them not very wealthy hippies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because when you're in the organic farming community. Yeah. But it, I mean, come on. What's 20 bucks or whatever? I mean, even still, dude, I mean, based on what, you know, Sarah was saying, you know, about them thinking that the attendance could be, you know, double, triple, quadruple or something like that. Yeah. Know, you never know. You never know. You never know.
I just sent a quick email to, to April from uh, Drupal Camp Asheville, ask if she had some way to get a special price because I don't think she paid that much money to use this app or she had sponsorship oh, through the university that gave I'm her a sure. discount. So James, it said that if you uh, are buying it month to month, that you can pay $100 per organizer or 99 per organizer per month. And then you were allowed 100 attendees. So if you were running like a Drupal camp, 100 isn't that big of a deal. But right. yeah, when you start getting up into the thousands, it said, when I was looking at the pricing page, uh, it said you pretty much have to be on the enterprise if you're going to have a thousand people at your virtual conference. It's the same thing with Zoom. That's where you run into problems. It's it's dirt cheap until you start hitting those big numbers, and then oh, but they got you then. Well, I mean, but in their defense, I mean, come on, man, you got like three thousand people showing up, and you can't pay eighteen grand. What kind of shit this man are I you? Wasn't, I wasn't bagging on it. I'm not just very saying. good at, at running businesses. If, yeah, no, I, I three thousand people coming, and you can't, you know, come up with eighteen grand. I'm, I'm not bagging on it. I, I'm just saying, you know, that that's what happens when you get into the big numbers is the assumption oh, yeah. is there that you're making money. So you're going to pay at least enough for us to make some money too. I don't disagree with that. You know, neither do I. I mean, that's shit. This country's built on capitalism. What are you going to do? <laughs> Be a big <laughs> capitalist. I'm, yeah. I mean, look, I work for a school that teaches entrepreneurship. Hell, I, if I don't support capitalism, you know, I'm in the wrong freaking boat. <laughs> that is true. You know, my kids will argue with me about it, but you know, and valid points there too, but Hey, it is what it is. But anyway, well, you just tell your kids if you, they have so many objections to the uh, state slash parent owning the, uh, you know, means of production slash house, they're welcome to pay rent. Uh, don't even get me started. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> and it's, it's Lauren rough. Out. Start chipping in. Yeah. Hey, look, I wouldn't want to be a student right now. I mean, I, it's harsh. It's brutal. I mean, so Rick, brutal. have you heard, uh, speaking of being a student right now, have you heard any rumblings about uh, whether or not SC is going to stick with the hybrid plan? Like I, I'd heard the, uh, a month ago that SC was going to be hybrid in the fall. But after Newsom's announcement yesterday. All bets are off, dude. There's, no, there's not going to be any in-person classes this fall. Mark my I words. I didn't think so either. I, that sounded like crap. It's not going to happen. It's yeah. not going to happen. Not to turn this into a political discussion, but when during this uh, talk, I had a pop-up show up on my phone that said that uh, Trump today actually publicly came out and endorsed wearing masks. Talk about a day late and a dollar short. Oh, yeah, I, I agree. Now the only question is all my redneck friends back home, they were like, I won't wear a mask. <laughs> I wonder if they're going to change their tune or if they're still going to run around going, I'm not going to wear a mask. Well, not to change the subject. But it was a political issue. It became a political issue. So it'll end on a political note, I guess. I guess. I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's, and, and what's sad, Chris, is it's, it's not just the Republican, you know, it's not, unfortunately. I, I went and got, I had to go get a, a, a test just yesterday mm -hmm. and uh, Dodger Stadium. And there were people getting out of cars to use the porta potty and didn't have a mask on. Yeah, we saw crowds of people down at uh, uh, Costa Mesa getting together for the fourth, you know, playing soccer, no masks, and like, Guys, you're scaring the daylights out of me. But I uh, guess I mean, the line of you... thinking is if you can survive the porta potty at Dodger Stadium without a mask, you can survive <laughs> anything. I don't know. Maybe that's that's the that's the line of thinking for that one. But uh, I, I I just think that <laughs> there's, just kind of there's, yeah, that's how you get immunity. <laughs> you know, there there's a certain number of people who think they're invincible, and 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 it's those people that Darwin wrote his theory about. <laughs> 
Yeah. That is I don't know, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm really curious to see what happens to education in general. And I'm just really happy that both of my kids, they're so young, it doesn't really matter yet. So yeah. in theory, it will be figured out, you know, by the time either one of them is really in school. Yeah, well, yeah, my college uh, student's very unhappy, I can tell you that, and I don't blame her. Oh, I would be so pissed. I would feel she like... She works I'm so awesome. hard for this experience, and, you know, she's in theater, and it's like, you know, online doesn't cut it, man. It'd you be one thing so if you just online? wanted the damn piece of paper, you know? If you just wanted the piece of paper, and you really didn't give a rat's ass about the experience of going to college... All right, and maybe being online wouldn't be so bad, but for most kids going to college, it's all about the college experience for one, and then to you know to be a th in theater as a stage manager, and not be able to have productions. It's like, what the? F yeah. Oh yeah. Anyway, yeah, that's, uh, yeah. we were talking about that too. Uh, my wife and I were about how incredibly different our college experiences were. You know, she basically went to school in China and it was just study, 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 no fun at all. Right. Literally basically cracked at every single yep. corner, you know, and I'm sitting here telling her about how, about, you know, fireman's ball, <laughs> you know, and, and how we built a three foot fireman slide that slid through the living room at a 79 degree angle, you know, at what felt like breakneck speeds while completely wasted. And she's like, yeah, that was not my college experience. Yeah. We got yeah. a citation from the city for the very same thing, same thing. <laughs> yeah. Nailed it. Yeah. yeah. Totally just well, I feel like I was robbed of the shenanigans I paid for. On the upside, we can, we do have to remember that all things will pass. And this, like all other things, will pass. I just hope it passes soon enough that it doesn't, you know, fuck up that experience for too long. It's yeah. one thing. It's one thing to lose a couple of semesters. I hope it doesn't freaking drag on for much more than that, though. Yeah. You know. But it's, yeah. It's it's uh, Chris. I appreciate you offering the warning. I don't want to be political, but biology isn't political. And as my cousin keeps saying, you know making something political bio biology trumps stupid every time so go for it oh i i completely agree i mean just go look at the map and see what states are run by republicans and what states are run by democrats oh if you see friend. that map is freaking <laughs> unbelievable and the it's, chart that goes along with that oh when you God. look at it, it the only problem is, is the people that don't the the people that are causing the problem, I don't know if they understand how statistics work and what trend lines look like at right. this point. I mean, the conversations I've had with some of my friends in high school, I'm just like, are you using that that liberal math stuff, man? What? What? what my understanding would be no math involved. Yeah, one of them, James. You'll you'll think you'll find this hilarious. I, I told my mother about a month ago that I feel horrible because. There was this really cute girl in high school named Luana that I had a crush on, and I always used to let her cheat off my science homework. And now she's an anti-vaxxer. And I'm just like, oh my God, I enabled that to her. <laughs> oh no, I never should have let her cheat. That's why she's so dumb. <laughs> but what do you do? Uh, paybacks are hell, huh, bro? <laughs> I know. I was just. I was like. I was thinking about this. Like, karma's a bitch, man. Like, oh what are you man, for Chris. Like, you totally ruined her. <laughs> Didn't think about that at sixteen. At sixteen, I was like, ooh, she's cute. <laughs> well, if it makes you feel any better, there were probably some other factors involved. She is just generally dumb. So. <laughs> See, so you, you know, it, it really wasn't on you, man. I mean. Yeah, was, I've got a friend. I've got a friend from grad school. She's a doctor in Boston, and her lab is hermetically isolated from the rest of the hospital to protect the hospital from the COVID work she's doing. She's at the heart of the beast. So, I, this is tough, man. This is crazy shit. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it is crazy shit. That's the, the one thing that. That's Hence the uh, you know showing up of Cajun cooking, comfort food, man. Yeah. 
Mm. I got I got jambalaya and etouffee, and if I can find the right ingredients, I'm working on some good gumbo next. So James, I have now mastered my grandma's southern biscuits recipe. Nice. And they are orgasmic, I'm telling you, man. They are like the greatest things ever. I've been making those biscuits and they're just so flaky. And then I make that with bacon and I make bacon, cheese, and biscuit sandwiches. Nice. Are you using uh, lard or are you using shortening? Straight up butter. Nice. Are you actually folding the dough with the butter in it and everything to get that flakiness? Oh, yeah. Oh, dude, that's crazy. Oh, no, I, I told you, I'm going old school like grandma taught me. Oh, man. I, all I can say is when this is over and we do have an in-person meetup, I, I say the first one, we have a potluck. And all you guys <laughs> And, and I yeah. gotta, uh, bring all this shit on. We could have like five minutes of discussion and two hours of eating. <laughs> Can I get a copy of that recipe? I'd love to try it. And just, if we do the eating, just let me know if people have, you know, kosher rules that I need to follow. Cause you know what? They can, bring, not they, can, they can bring their own kosher. And I, and, and I, <laughs> and I can say that with authority. Well, some people uh, uh, have, have a shellfish allergy and I can cook jambalaya with the shrimp or without without okay make it without put the fish shrimp on the side i'll mix mine in on the go i only eat whatever is <laughs> vegetarian so I'm oh yeah that's right we got a veggie yeah it's not one bit vegetarian <laughs> Sorry, i know sure. i know <laughs> are, are animal products okay like butter yeah yeah he eats cheese okay so Look, I just, I, I, see, so long as I see the food and I don't realize that it has meat in it, I'm okay. Once I know the, you know, once I know it, the illusion's gone and it's like, oh man, now I can't eat it. That, that's, yeah. that's, the, that's the trick. It's all I right. just it's don't it. ask questions. I don't ask yeah. questions. So, so if I make like bacon grease Brussels sprouts, I just <laughs> tell you that. Just I don't tell me. Just don't tell me. It, they're just Brussels no. sprouts, Chuck, I yeah. swear. <laughs> that's definitely not bacon grease. Oh, dude, that's wrong on so many levels. <laughs> no, but I, I do actually make, I literally, after I make my biscuits, you know, with bacon, I take the bacon grease aside, save it, and then I use it to cook Brussels sprouts later. Yeah, I can, right. The best way of making Brussels sprouts. I can yeah, right. Because it has other flavors and stuff in it at that yeah. point, right? So, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's just really, no. good. It's really good. No, I, I, my, I don't knock meat food. I, I like the smell of it. I just can't. It's just like a, I, I yeah, just can't eat it if I know about it kind of a thing for me. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I promise tell not me? to tell you what I'm doing when we have our potluck. That sounds good to me. <laughs> my, I my, promise it will all be really, really good. Everyone just <laughs> yes, happened to make vegetarian food. I, I didn't ask if it was vegetarian. <laughs> they just told me it's okay to hey, eat. You know so, what? I, I'll tell you I, what. I, I, I've got a vegetarian daughter, so because I, I, I feel it so much for you, my dish that I'm bringing is vegetarian. Mm -hmm. oh. Yep, I'm going to make you what I've been making for my daughter, pineapple fried rice with cashews. Nice. That sounds really That good. sounds tasty. It's kick-ass. Uh, I'll, I'll make some I would love your recipe for pineapple fried rice, by the way. Dude, I, it's a combination of – I. it's basically a Chinese recipe, but I, I throw a little – Thai twist in there, so I don't use the sesame oil. I use coconut milk instead. Coconut oil. Okay. Oh man, dude, kicks butt. Well, it's great. seriously, seriously, good. Rick, send me send me the recipe because I've been tonight. We had uh, garlic butter fried rice Ooh. with, with shell, uh, shallots and fresh chopped uh, garlic. Oh, sounds nice. It sounds okay. good. Well, uh, Shook, I'm I'm wondering if I can get away with creating an etouffee. Because etouffee can be put on anything, chicken, shrimp, crawfish. And I'm wondering if I could substitute in eggplant, which I've been grilling uh, okay. the daylights yeah. out of. My wife and I are just loving it. And Love grilled eggplant. Eggplant's awesome and for the texture and consistency of meat products. Mm -hmm. And you know, we'll, so it will have the same cooking properties and still give me the opportunity to serve up the flavor. All right. I think at next meetup, we might have to have, leave some time at the end for recipes, man. This is fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, the pandemic, so, what the hell else are you gonna do i mean i'm telling you yeah, so here's here's the pandemic james like i'm not ordering anything from any restaurant so i literally cook breakfast lunch and dinner every single day 
something my uh, if you like eggplant here's here's something that my wife discovered that I absolutely love I used to I tried for years to grill eggplant and it always tasted like freaking shoe leather to me I hated it right <laughs> just didn't it's one of those things like it doesn't work on the grill it just doesn't work she said let's brush it with a lot of, little olive oil you know, you got to be careful because it's absorbent. So you don't want to turn it, mm -hmm. make it soggy. But if mm -hmm. you're quick with that brush and you just give a little quick brush of olive oil on both sides, something about the heat that that oil attracts, it grills unbelievable. Yeah. I can actually tell you what it That's is. exactly what we do. I've, I've honestly looked this up and been studying this lately. Oh, there's science behind it. I knew it. it Leave it to, to a nerd. Go ahead, Chris. It has to do with the smoke point of the oil. So when you utilize uh, something like a, a grapeseed oil, for example, or a coconut oil, they have a very, very high smoke point. So you can fry it at a fairly high temperature and it won't actually like light up or turn brown or smoke. But when you do it with an olive oil, the smoke point is substantially lower. So that's why if you coat your, those Brussels sprouts in olive oil instead of bacon grease, and then you like roast them in the oven, that... Uh, olive oil will actually start to smoke and will actually crisp all of the Brussels sprouts versus if you do it with say grapeseed oil it won't actually like smoke if you will and so it won't be all crispy now ah. so yeah if you go that. online like uh, oil smoke points you'll basically see a little chart that'll show you like the most soft core oil that burns really really fast to the more high temperature oils and just kind of like where it is in that spectrum. And then you can, you know, use it to manipulate things like, for example, have, using olive oil to make stuff like crispy or like blackened or grill marked or right. that makes sense. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Uh, we've just been using meat seasoning, uh, SPG, salt, pepper, garlic. Uh, on the eggplant with just a touch of the olive oil and zucchini right next to it. It's great. Or in, in when I've run out, I just hit, pull out the Italian uh, wishbone Italian dressing, coat it with that. Nice. That's actually how we used to make uh, chicken at Red Lobster, James, is we would actually marinate it in <laughs> Italian dressing overnight which when you really think about it, all you're really doing is mixing vinegar oil and Mediterranean seasoning. That's really what Italian dressing is. And it does make for a pretty badass chicken. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, anything that's got a high vinegar content is practically pre-cooking it too. So you're just adding to, it's tenderizing it basically. So you're not only marinating it, but you're actually gonna make it much more tender to the mouth when it's you know, cooked. Well, we're re -re reheating meat in the microwave, uh, just about a teaspoon to a tablespoon of that same Italian dressing has been my secret for years to keep it moist and add a little seasoning. Simple mm. trick. Interesting. Yeah, if you're, Interesting. if you're really into cooking, by the way, and, uh, and you want something to watch, I would highly, 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 I can't say the word highly enough, <laughs> recommend a show on Netflix right now called salt fat acid heat Ooh. oh yeah i know this one yeah saw it really saw good. the whole thing yep saw the yeah, whole I season learned a lot from watching that like i had no idea like how intricate salt was yeah mm -hmm. i mean that just blew my freaking mind and i'm so much better with salt now after watching that than i yeah. was that like, woman's pretty fun to watch too she's pretty interesting she's really into eating <laughs> yeah that whole tip of like as soon as you get home from the store, salt and pepper your meat and then rewrap it back up and put it back in the fridge. Mm -hmm. That was like the best advice I've ever seen in my life. Like all of my meat is like 10 times better now uh, than it was before. Just from that one stupid trick that. Yeah. Yeah. It's speaking, of, uh, speaking of stupid tricks that I learned all these years, I thought I put salt in my water because I thought it was going to make the water boil faster. The real trick is that your the salt actually penetrates the pasta so that you don't have to salt your food that the salt's actually in the pasta. Yep. I didn't I've well, never I never thought about that. It, it's actually really true. That it, it the the flavor the amount of flavor that you get from the salt and it is so much better than putting the salt on top of your food. 
<laughs> or you have to keep mixing it because then you get down to the bottom of the bowl and there's no salt left, you know, but if yep. it's actually in the damn pasta, anyway, good to see you. Good night, guys. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I, I saw a crazy quick show here. that I watched on YouTube and um, they talked about when to add salt and stuff like that. So like they said, like with meats and stuff, it's better to add it before you cook and whatnot. Let it kind of break in uh -huh. the meats and stuff like that. Whereas with um, vegetables and stuff like that, you can kind of just salt it right before or even just do it after you cook and whatnot. It doesn't really um, matter quite as much. But like with, yeah, with meats and stuff like pre-seasoning it letting it sit for a while just adds more depth to its flavor and with like yeah with other stuff it's not yeah um it's good to salt it still but you know you can you don't yeah, have to do true. it an hour or two hours or a day in advance for a for i didn't know finish. this trick but evidently you're supposed to use or before i watched that show but you're supposed to use different salts for those different steps as well yep. so evidently there's like finishing salt which would be like a, a fleur de sel or something like that, which is really, really expensive, which you can kind of add on top. But mm -hmm. there's like more hardcore salts, like a, like a kosher salt or kosher sea salt, which right. you would use for more like the pre-salting the meat stuff. And right. I, I mean, no those other things will help bring it up in depth, but like at least like the core when you salt like stuff is like, okay, with, with meats, it's like, okay, do it. If you do it an hour, 30 minutes to an hour before you cook with it, like that's the, the most important stuff. The other parts are like, you know, elevated dining at that stage. Hi. So yeah, that's nice. go put little man in bed because we're already well past bedtime. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. All good. If one of you want, if you guys want to keep going, uh, I can make one of you host. Otherwise, no, I'm going to sign off. Uh, it's that time I'm ready. Too. Um, I'm going to. I'll tell you, the craziest cookie foods. thing I've seen is a tomato soup cake. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. But the tomato soup substitutes for the milk and the egg and comes out fine. And my aunt says she's done it. Awesome. So cool. look for that video cool. and, and you're sort of be in disbelief. Yeah, you, I made that oh. face. Go, you're kidding me. But you don't taste it. Well, Y'all have a great night. It's great to see everybody. That does sound interesting. <laughs> All right. Take care. Good night, everyone.